L L E T E R. And Cameo, you raised your hand. I'm hoping you would say something about this and sort of the the way you've been working with the five ranks and the rank you've been working with. I think it'll be helpful for people to hear. I just want to add about Ross Bolliter, and I'll I can type his name in the chat and uh, for you guys. He's an improv jazz musician and it totally shows up in his writing. Like, I mean, he's so, he's like that, um, it's like poetry. I don't know how else to describe it. Like his writing is so spontaneous and fresh and playful and funny. And so this, this when I read what we read for today, the commentary by Dong Chun's student, I was like, I don't, I've been thinking about this for over a year and I don't understand what I just read. Um, so it's just different uh, how it's talked about in English. Um, what did you want me to say, Joshua? Or what was the question, the invitation? Um, well, I know you've been working fairly extensively with the five ranks over the past year or so, and I was wondering if you wanted to explain sort of your sense of them and how you're working with them and how you're working with the sort of the rank that you've been working with. Mm -hmm. So as a practice, not just an intellectual exercise. So I think um, like what Joshin just said about them being descriptive of a moment in practice, that, that has been my access to working with it. Um, kind of like a framework for, so for example, um, the first rank, which is about foregrounding the relative, or in the cleary thing that we read, the spoken within the unspoken. I think the way I the way I've worked with that one is um, having a deeper appreciation for coming to understand the absolute through the relative. So like there, there can't be something unspoken without something spoken. Um, and this is where I think last summer in the Diamond Sutra class, I, I got so tripped up on, it's just so hard to, for me, it's hard to comprehend something that is so incredibly non-dual. Like it's like a third kind of thinking or something. And, and, and so for me, the five ranks have been really helpful in a very daily moment to moment way working with um, how I'm observing the relative, how I'm living in this relative world, and how I'm um, processing or integrating prajna, the, the emptiness of everything. Um, and so the fourth rank is the one that really stuck to me, the one that goes, no need to dodge when the blades are crossed. The skillful one is like a lotus sitting in the fire Seemingly you yourself possess the aspiration to soar to the heavens. I love that one. It's all there. The blades are the absolute and the relative. Having a lotus mind while sitting in the midst of all sorts of fire. And then at the end of the day, the practice is up to us. Seemingly you yourself possess the aspiration to soar to the heaven. What could be more beautiful than that? And so what Bolliter says is, it's, it's us, the practice is us, um, and the way we manifest that in community, for sure. Anyway, I find it really beautiful. It's a really rich teaching. It's a really um, subtle teaching as well. And the five ranks are something that, um, you know, I've not, I've not studied them academically. I've always just related to them practice wise, but it's a teaching that um, you can come back to again and again and find something new or find something different. And, um, you know, our lineage doesn't emphasize it too much. I mean, it's definitely there, um, but it's not like, Ooh, come learn the five ranks. Like it's super important to learn. Come learn the five ranks. Usually the way I would encounter it is I would go to my teacher and I would say, 
look, this is what's going on in my life. And this is the practice question I'm stumbling over. And this is how I'm approaching it. And he would go, hmm. That's like the third rank. Or, oh, OK. That's a, that's a first rank view. And you know, so I'd have to, and he would never explain it to me. So I'd always have to like try to wrap my head around what in the world he was talking about and go look things up and figure things out again. Um, so, you know, that said, I think I started off saying I'm not an expert in the five ranks. So, um, but yet there's still, there's still important to know um, in terms of they're one of the main teachings of the Tsaodong school, which became the Soto school in Japan, which is um, sort of the flavor of Zen that we practice at Y East and at Darmory. Um, any questions or thoughts there? Yep. I just wanted to add my understanding was that especially the bit about function and knowledge and that you can have all the knowledge in the world and but you can't pass it out to know, you can't give people knowledge. Knowledge is not something that you can give them because what they need is not the knowledge, it is putting it into practice. If you aren't functioning you are not part of the absolute. You are still relative. You need to become absolute to function. What is it to be a functioning Buddha? What is it to be a functioning Dixie? What does it mean to function? Functioning, the Dharma wheel turns. Turning is function. Function is lack of suffering. Mm. So I found it very profound. Yay. Yay. Yeah. We come to it and we... This is the practicing of working with the five ranks. It's reading it and this is how it lands for me. And then continuing practice and coming back to it. And, oh, this is how it's landing for me now. I'm continuing to practice and coming back to it. Oh, oh, there's this level. I didn't know this. I didn't know this one. I didn't have this sense of it. I think that in a way, that's a way that Zen tends to work with the, the teachings and the literature is to not try to explain everything. Um, and I think that's why for this particular class, I made it very explicit. You know, I'm not, I'm not explaining things to you that we're gonna be reading these readings and encountering them together and coming back together and talking about them or discussing them or sharing a memory that these teachings evoke or um, some people have sent me artwork of, of things that have come up for them um, in response to the readings. But once again, that's still relationship. And that's so strong in Zen is that sense of relationship between um, the experiencer and that which is experienced, the knower and that which is known, uh, each of us and the, the world we encounter. In the section on Dongshan, we also had um, a translation of the Precious Mirror Samadhi, which is something that is chanted regularly at Dharma Rain. We've, we've chanted them for one of the um, months for our, our evening chant at Y East. And I'm wondering if anything jumped out for anyone with this translation. I know there were certain times when I, I read a line and went, huh, what's that in the way we chant it? And I'd have to go chant through the whole chant until I hit that line. Oh, okay, that's it, that's it. But does reading it, for those of you who are familiar with the way we chant it, does reading it in a different translation bring forward anything new? Or did you have any sort of aha moments? Like, oh, that's what it means. Or, oh, oh, we say this and I didn't understand it, but now with this translation, it makes more sense. 
Were there any of those parts in there? A little yes. bit? Yes, but I'm not sure I got it right here reading it in this translation. I just got a different meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. there, would you, are you interested in sharing any of those places that? Well, like when it says babbling like a baby, mm -hmm. um, that reminds me of um, the mind by itself. When I go into meditation, right. there's a certain stage at which the mind just babbles by itself. It has no meaning, it has no context, it just throws out words and phrases and sounds. And mm -hmm. I felt like I had um, understood something there, but not entirely what it was I had understood, whether or not that was me, I was it, or what, but it really struck me there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. What about for others of you? I uh, found myself, re uh, yeah, um, kind of not liking the translation and maybe that's just because of habit i don't i don't know but mm -hmm. um the the horse references it's always the the outside still and inside trembling is mm -hmm. very evocative for me and so i didn't like the way they changed it i didn't like this translation um i i don't know it took me a long time to to have a relationship with the precious mirror samadhi and mm -hmm. so um and I feel like I love it a really lot. And then I do that. I do have a personal relationship with it. And so reading this translation will make me have to, um, re, you know, reevaluate aspects of that relationship, which is just a nuisance <laughs> sometimes, you know, when you, <laughs> when you think you like it and you, and you think you understand it to have it all, um, uh, re rearranged. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to be a little bit out of your comfort zone. Totally, yeah. It doesn't mean I have to like it, but I know it's good for me. Yeah. Right, right after the tiger and horse, mm -hmm. because of the existence of the lowly, there are precious furnishings and fine clothes. I didn't get it until I read that translation that uh, mm. because of the existence of the unusual, there are house cats and cattle. Mm -hmm. There's two ends of the continuum mm -hmm. for whatever the, whatever good that does me to know that. But I'll go back and read it again. But, but the two ends of those two ends of the continuum sort of define each other. Yeah, without without the one there's not the other yes yeah. so it's there's a, a relative relationship there okay i heard the word <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what 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 relative relative well it's kind of like the two sides of a penny you know it's mm. still but um mm -hmm. i really like the skill an archer can hit a target a hundred paces away that the needing of arrow points has nothing to do with skill. And I kind of interpreted that to mean that's luck or providence or fate or just something really magical that might happen. And so a really talented athlete or whatever, it's a little bit of both. It's skill, but it's also this in undefinable sort of thing. Mm. I... Um, you know, there's always that that's outside what we can point to and say, yes, that person or that thing happened because of this and this and this. But then sometimes you can't really explain things that happen that way. And you mm -hmm. just have to accept that it's 
something something marvelous happens and we didn't make it happen. Right, right. And I think that's what they're talking about here. So. And it wasn't our own effort. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. When I read, when a wooden man begins to sing, the stone woman gets to, up to dance. When I read it, it reminded me of Carlos Santa and Caravanserai. But there's a nice, nice imagery there because, you know, the Buddha is the leader of the caravan. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's some very nice things there. But the one thing that sticks out at me is the way confusion go, goes, even blacks considered white. Mm. Uh, when confused imagination ends, mind in its simplicity real, realises itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I really quite like that. The sort of, you know, how do we paint um, what do we paint with our minds? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like really lovely, uh, subtle teachings in this. And, you know, for years and years and years and years and years, I would just chant this every Sunday, every other day during Ango, um, you know, every fourth day during summers and winters. And I think at some point I got really tired of it. It was just like, oh God, this again. Like, do we ever change up our chance? We never change our chance. It's the same thing every single Sunday. And then at some point I, I read it and maybe I had read it in a different translation. So it, it, uh, it wasn't the, usual phrasing that I can just say without a thought. I was like, oh, hey, look at that. Huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, that part's juicy. Mm Mm-hmm. And ever since then, I've enjoyed chanting it. Even though I have enough chanting practice that I don't, I don't think about the words when I'm chanting them which is, you know, how I was taught to chant. But, you know, it still changed my relationship to the, to the chant again, to the teachings again, such that I find this much more pleasant to chant than I used to. I'm not as bored with it as I was. Hmm. I also like that that business that you were talking about, Shokai, the, because of the existence of the lily, there are precious furnishings and fine clothes. Because of the existence of the unusual, there are house cats and cattle. You know, without, without the mundane, we don't know what special is. Without something special, we don't know what the everyday is. Oh. Jessen, um, so that seems entirely different from cats and white oxen. I, I think of white oxen as being special. I thought, I thought cats and white oxen were both special. Mm. Or, yeah. I have to, I have to, like, I'm trying to go back to the other chant. Yeah. Um, so because some are wide, wide-eyed and in you know I never really parsed that too closely but I just um, I love the image because some are wide-eyed cats and white oxen so I didn't think of one as I didn't think of them as two ends of yeah, no it didn't yeah. it didn't strike me that way at all just <clears throat> I also have a prejudice reaction against the uh, precious furnishings and fine clothes because mm-hmm. of the existence of the lowly. I, I, don't know. I think I put more value on the lowly. Than, mm-hmm. uh, but 
um, who knows what it says in the uh, <laughs> Chinese. Mm -hmm. Apropos of translations and uh, the as I un, yeah as I as I think about it, the, the Chinese ideograms actually have many different meanings, more than you would think. Uh, as in some other non uh, phonetic languages, so, uh, such that um, it does depend an awful lot on who's reading it. Yeah. And at the same time, these have been commented on for Centuries, oh, so some yeah. of that flavor still comes. A lot of a lot of who has been reading it. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something about that? The lowly and the precious furnishings. I think the way I was held that one was like because people come to practice with certain sets of karmic habits, we offer them something very different just to shake them out of habitual ways of being in this world to help you see that it's a constructed self. So that's the, for the, like those two pairings of two lines, that's how I've held them. But I, I didn't, I didn't get the unusual and like house cats thing until reading this translation. It was, that was helpful. I was like chanting it though, cats and white oxen. <laughs> yeah, because with that, with that, because of the existence of the unusual, there are house cats and cattle, sort of the everyday uh, animals someone would interact with or see or encounter. Um, when I read this, I also had the thought, uh, maybe because I have parents, that house cats and cattle are domesticated animals. They aren't what happened in nature. They are what we created over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. versus precious furnishings and fine clothes. That's something that can happen in a single lifetime. But house cats and cattle don't happen in a single lifetime. Hmm. That's an interesting view. Nice. I like the way people are bringing themselves into the chant, into the teaching. So it's 4.58, I'm clocking the time, and I do want to move on to Hongzhou, if that's all right. Um, I want to read some of cultivating it. So uh, Taigen Leighton translated a lot of Hongzhou's uh, material, cultivating the empty field, the silent illumination of Zen master Hongzhou. This is um, a text that whenever, oftentimes when we're doing Mondo or a, a, an exercise where people prevent, present a verse and uh, other people ask questions about it and they, they respond. Um, this is one of the, <coughs> excuse me, places I often go to find little texts. Hold on one second, I'm gonna cough. What is that link that you just put in there, Camille? It's a citation for Tigan's book and it's a review from oh, Tricep okay. Magazine when they put it out. Great. Um, so, Here's an example. Silently, got, do what? Go ahead. I've got a, a, I see here I can put files on. I've actually got a, a photocopy of part of Bolitor's book here. Hmm. 
um, if people want a copy of it, I don't know. It's it's um, it's the second chapter and the last chapter. Whether that's relevant to people or not. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe um, people can check in with you after class or offline if they want. Yeah, I was just going to add it. I was just going to put it into the chat there, and then oh, okay. if people want it, they can have it. Okay. So this is from um, Cultivating the Empty Field. Silently dwell in the self. In true suchness, abandon conditioning. Open-minded and bright without defilement. Simply penetrate and drop off everything. Today is not your first arrival here. Since the ancient home before the empty kalpa, clearly nothing has been obscured. Although you are inherently spirited and splendid, still you must go ahead and enact it. When doing so, immediately display every atom without hiding a speck of dirt. Dry and cool and deep repose profoundly understand. If your rest is not satisfying and you yearn to go beyond birth and death, there can be no such place. Just burst through and you will discern without thought dusts, pure without reasons for anxiety. Stepping back with open hands giving up everything, is thoroughly comprehending life and death. Immediately you can sparkle and respond to the world, merge together with all things. Everywhere is just right. Accordingly, we are told that from ancient to modern times, all dharmas are not concealed, always apparent and exposed. So that's how uh, Hongzhou sounds translated by Tygen Leighton. I'll read you one more piece. I can find it. Emptiness is without characteristics. Illumination has no emotional afflictions. With piercing, quietly profound radiance, it mysteriously eliminates all disgrace. Thus one can know oneself. Thus the self is completed. We all have the clear, wondrously bright field from the beginning. Many lifetimes of misunderstanding come only from distrust, hindrance, and screens of confusion that we create in a scenario of isolation. With boundless wisdom journey beyond this, forgetting accomplishments. Straightforwardly abandon stratagems and take on responsibility. Having turned yourself around, accepting your situation, if you set foot on the path, spiritual energy will marvelously transport you. Contact phenomena with total sincerity, not a single atom of dust outside yourself. So looking at the Hongzhou that we read for today's class, um, some of you mentioned earlier parts that stand out, but let's return to that. What are parts that stand out? This is the sermon section, correct? Uh, yep. Okay. For me, it was the dig the pond, don't wait for the moonlight. When the pond is complete, the moonlight will appear. Mm -hmm. So what did that bring up for you? Why is that, like, what, what is it that you go, ah, yeah. That you, you can't waiting for things to happen, you have to do it, and then it will happen. Mm -hmm. I, it doesn't sound not right, but. Yeah. I like that the imagery is so, um, not necessarily concrete, but, but, uh, Vivid. Hmm. 
Moonlight in Zen often has, uh, uh, it stands in for enlightenment or awakening. So dig the pond, don't wait for the moonlight. Do the work, don't wait for awakening. When the pond is complete, moonlight will naturally be there. When the work is done, awakening is there. I would push back a little bit on the complete aspect, but um, it's such a beautiful, beautiful image. It's something that shows up a lot in Zen. To me, it brings up um, the concept of goals and, and um, like in AA, they're saying is um, to or just do what's in front of you to do and to let go of the outcomes. Um, I think actually it, it, something about like God be in charge of that, but um, yeah, just do the just do the work and and um, let go of the outcome. And if the work is right. You know, but you know, maybe the outcome won't be what you want. That's not that's not your concern. Just mm -hmm. do just do what's in front of you to do. Mm -hmm. It it ha it has to do with goal setting for me in one aspect. We used to teach kids um, when um, I used to teach kids to to ride and we'd go to shows and they and we would talk about goals and they would say, well, I want to win this class and. And I would say, well, you can't really control that, but you can keep your heels down and you can get the course right. Mm -hmm. So like that. Mm -hmm. Paying attention to what's in front of you as opposed to. Yeah. What you can, what you can control as opposed to what you, you can. Mm -hmm. I can't really command the Samadhi cat to come and sit in my lap, but I can <laughs> create the lap for it. <laughs> Yeah. 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 We create conditions. Yeah. And we inherit conditions. Joshin, mm -hmm. I uh, I I found a lot of the discussion in this section really interesting about how it it helps. There's a lot of discussion about how to deal with reality and life and, um, and then how do you integrate that personally mm -hmm. um, with all these concepts and all these things and, and, and the continuum and, and all. And um, I found it really interesting because it kind of points to the fact that if you want to understand compassion and the way maybe Buddha sees or, or sees people or sees everything really, then an individual person it can experience love and loving another person. And that helps them understand what that universal love is like, or if it's, it's like, we were human beings and the way we understand things and the way we interpret it is, is, is what's in front of us a lot. And so there was the stay, saying that says, standing alone and unchanging, acting comprehensively and inexhaustibly, do, do not disdain the phenomena filling your eyes. You must trust that in the world, which is only mental, the thousand peaks all point to the summit and the hundred rivers all end in the sea. If you understand in this way, you roll up the screens and remove the blinds. If you do not understand in this way, you shut the doors and create a barrier. Whether discussing understanding or non-understanding, ignoramuses are not quick. And so I sort of interpreted that um, because I sort of struggle with that. I mean, I'm not going to become a monk or um, go live in Tibet and, you know, and, and, and uh, turn away from my life. 
so how do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you um, work with what is mm -hmm. and what you're given? And I find a lot of these, the, a lot of the imagery, a lot of the poetry, a lot of the sermons are all sort of getting at that. And I, I really like that. Um, and, and it helps me because it's sort of, it's sort of like all together, sort of, I mean, it all comes in through us and is expressed out into the world. And that's really where the beauty is, is how do we express what we feel Buddhism is out into the world. And that's where the magic is. And I, I really um, find that they're, they're, they're trying to, to explain it in lots of different ways. Um, but uh, it's, it's there. And, and, um, and, and it's inaffable. It's not anything you can really say, this is what it is. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's how I sort of enjoy a lot of the, the writing in, in whom she's um, section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Oftentimes in Buddhism, there's a, a you know, a, a thread or a tone that seems to imply, you know, leave behind the phenomena, leave behind the relative world, go focus on emptiness or the abstract or uh, the tangible things of this world are a hindrance, let go of them. And one of the things that Zen tends to celebrate is that awakening can be found within the relative world. And part of, uh, part of the teachings of the five ranks is you know, like playing with that idea of, of absolute and relative and um, you know, the fact that you can't hide out in emptiness. I mean, you can try, but it doesn't really work in the long run. So it's not a place to stay, um, which then, you know, you can, you can taste it, you can have a glimpse of it, you can have an experience, but then there's still more to do. Then there's still that process of um, returning to the relative, returning to the mundane, and incorporating that vision of emptiness within everyday life, within conditions. So in Zen, we have like the 10 ox herding pictures, which are 10 images that show a path of practice. And Awakening is somewhere like seven or eight. I can't remember which. The last picture in the ox herding pictures is returning to the marketplace with bliss bestowing hands. So it's not hiding out in emptiness or hiding away from the world. It's actually returning to the world, engaging with the world with this view that has been shaped by an encounter with the absolute or encounter with emptiness that then is put into play for the benefit of all beings. So this is where that, that sort of uh, that Mahayana path, that Bodhisattva orientation becomes implicit is that, you know, whatever the fruits of our practice are, they get turned over into uh, being of benefit to others. And whether that's being of benefit, um, in a householder life or being of benefit in our ordained life, it's all still service. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Well, jo Joshi, don't you think sometimes misinterpret, people can sometimes misinterpret Buddhism as being very nihilistic about nothing matters, everything yeah. changes, and you know, there's no such thing that, everybody's going to die and so you know, why even care about anything or care about anything you know anybody and yep. life is crap you know so why even try kind of a thing you know and i i've talked to people before that say well isn't that what buddhism is and i have to sort of explain you know that that's not what it is but if you uh sometimes if you sort of didn't really 
look into it a little farther, you might think that's what a lot of the teaching is sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, in the same vein, I can say that my understanding of Christianity is based on sort of popular secular American holidays like Christmas and Easter. And I don't even really know all that much about Easter. Um, yeah, of course, people are going to have those ideas about Buddhism. And um, if they're really that curious, they'll investigate and dig deeper. And hopefully find someone who can uh, talk to them about what it is, teach them how to practice. And I think, I don't think there's anybody who can actually say Buddhism is and define it. I think, I think this whole path is one of investigation and questioning and looking and seeking and experiencing and revising and continuing. And um, yeah, I don't, there's not a, there's not an easy definition. Every, every definition is um, conditioned and limited. I like the um, passage on page 93. I just sort of read it again. I had to quickly mark it. I went and got some post-it notes because I, I put marks on everything when I read it. So. <laughs> uh, and I have to remember it for later because it reminded me of something else. But every flame of the eonic, of the eonic fire is a member of events. In the emptiness of the eonic void, there is a pedestal of awareness. There is no more beauty and ugliness to make flaws. Beauty and ugliness both come from here. And I really like the use of paradox there um, about a pedestal and an awareness of a pedestal being placed in emptiness. So it's really quite paradoxical. But the other thing I really liked is that every flame of the ionic fire is an ember of events. And one of the things that we were talking about yesterday, and I've been doing some work on anyway, is about how does Dharma come about, mm -hmm. in particularly in, an, in a Sanskrit sense, but also uh, in the sense of um, Eastern religions and Buddhism is not linear. So there is no beginning, there's no end. And there's cycles. And it comes to that question about the Dharma and when does the Dharma arise? And like, you know, there's been various Buddhas and how um, the flame of the Dharma is carried forward. I, 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 that's how I read it, but um, it's probably a peculiar reading, but I like it. Yeah. I like it as well. I like that sense of, um, I like that phrasing of ember of events. It yeah. reminds me that each of each moment is just a spark. Yeah. In this bigger flame, this bigger burning. Yeah. Well, it also reminds me too that, um, you know, our actions can have fruit our actions can be embers and sometimes you want those embers to just die down but also too sometimes you have thoughts which you think are just the most amazing ember so it has to to give off light for the universe and you know that's not necessarily the case it's just sometimes placing something on a pedestal so. sometimes embers can be dangerous yeah so. I just wanted to say on this idea of what Buddhism is or what these readings are about is that to me, and, and I think I've learned this by the readings and the Dharma and all that, but um, the whole, the transformation that 
is possible is only realized in relationship. The, the work is isolated and personal, but the result of the work is how we relate to other people and events and things that happen. Um, so that's when I can tell if a transformation is taking place because my reaction is different than it has been before. Hmm. Can you say more about like what it is that you notice? What is it that's different? Well, um, for me, it's that what had before would, would spark a reaction, just it happens and, oh, nothing happened <laughs> um, or I my reaction is to respond in a way that is helpful or um, worthwhile mm -hmm. and so the part that becomes the, the selflessness becomes that there's the self isn't reacting, that thing that became offended, that, that thing that thought it was being attacked is, is neutralized or just allows it to happen. It just, it just happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the other thing that in this reading that I became aware of that this is this idea that I don't understand, but I do understand mm -hmm. is that at some point I realized that, that there's a, there's a depth to the, the, well, how do you say this? Enlightenment happens and can happen all the time, but there's a depth to it that I, I haven't yet approached. That's the, um, I don't know if it's not a goal, but that, that, oh, okay, I'm, I'm having glimpses of this, but wow, there's just a, there's just a lot more there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> well, my hope, my hope for reading this book, and I've mentioned this before, but I want to reiterate it, is that, you know, the purpose of encountering these teachings in this way is to start to become familiar with some of the phrases and imagery and words used to um, describe practice from a Zen perspective. And, you know, we're not looking for a conceptual understanding, but that like looking for those moments where you encounter a phrase and you go, oh yeah, kind of like what you were talking about, Ed, where it's not so much uh, an intellectual understanding, but there's something there that recognizes what's being talked about or written about. There's something there that recognizes a truth or um, an understanding that's not a wordy understanding. It's not a, an understanding that can be spoken, but it's something that is, that illuminates. We talk about illumination a lot in Zen, um, but there is that recognition. And it's a, oftentimes for me, it's a warm, a sense of warmth, a sense of lightness, a sense of brightness, a sense of um, closeness, of intimacy, when I'm reading a bit of Dharma that, you know, has that quality, or when there's that moment of, of recognition. But yeah. So we're getting close to the end of our class. Any last thoughts? Uh, 
absolute relative. I don't know if this has any would help clarify anything to anyone, but I, when I was thinking about the difference between the two and how to explain them, weight versus mass. Mm. <laughs> And then I have to go back and relearn my physics again. Mass is, <laughs> mass is the same everywhere. Weight is relative to which planet you're on and what gra your gravity is. There we go. Yeah. And if that's a great way to, to help you remember, go for it. Joshua, on page um, 89, this this um, passage that the lamp is bright, the hall is empty, as a weaving girl operates the loom, the path of the shuttle is fine. The water is luminous, the night quiet, a fisherman clutches his reed cloak around him, the moonlight in the boat cold. Have you ever reached this state this time? That, and uh, that's such a, such a beautiful passage. And I don't know, um, you know, what it means. <laughs> Could you Where say something? Yeah. So, well, you know, on my Kindle, it claims to be eight, page 89, but it doesn't always get the pages right. So, but it would be. Middle my, of 90. Thank you. Middle of 90. Ah. So you started with the lamp is bright? Is yes. That? And I, it's very, uh, I have a beautiful image. Like I would like to paint that scene mm. of the medieval castle and the girl at her loom and um, with this sh fine shuttle and outside the water is luminous and it's a quiet night but I I don't you know I don't I don't know what the s symbols mean I, and I wondered if you could the moon we know or, or do I just hold the, the image and I would say just hold the image. Okay, thank you. There's a... What is that felt sense that arises when bringing up that image? Mm -hmm. Peace. Mm -hmm. But there's, it's kind of there's uh it's cold there's also as for me a sense of time um is the path of the shuttle mm -hmm. also yin and yang yeah. the fem feminine and masculine mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. the two kinds of work taken mm -hmm. oh at yeah at the same time yeah i hadn't so thought of that having in mind um the two kinds of dynamic. I mean, um, mm. there, there is some sense in, um, in some of the uh, other um, writings of, say, Jai Zhang, where instead of thinking about, you know, duality as this, you know, like two opposing things, mm -hmm. I think this is what Kemio was saying before about there's a third something and they it's like sort of saying oh yeah I can see that there's a duality so therefore I've stepped out of it mm. and it's that kind of provisional truth mm -hmm. so it's that kind of awareness of yeah there's this energy and that energy mm -hmm. there's this masculine energy there's this feminine energy and it's a very I mean it's very traditional I prefer to be uh, sitting inside and cooking dinner and for my partner Melody to be outside mowing the lawn mm. which she actually prefers to do so it's sort of like a I prefer to cook right so. thank you that was for, that was really helpful thank you with a lot of these things When they're brought up in terms of practice or teaching, oftentimes the, 
there's no one set interpretation of the text, but what becomes important is how someone responds to it, which then, you know, the teacher sees and either nudges gently one way or another way, depending on um, what the student is bringing forward. So in a way, you know, each of these, each of these writings becomes a bit of a, a practice tool that the students then saying, you know, what is this? This is how I see it and offering their own interpretation or commentary. And then the teacher uses that commentary to say, okay, maybe you're getting stuck here and move in this direction or, hey, you're getting stuck here and move in this direction. So that's part of why when you asked about that particular image or if you should just sit with the image, you know, my heartfelt response was like, sit with the image, see where it takes you. Like follow if that, if that interest is there, like spend some time with that in a meditative state and see where it leads you because I think there's something very juicy there. Thank you. I, yeah. I will. Yeah. And with that, we're at 531. Um, our next class is the House of Yunmen, and it will be on August 30th. So we actually have two weeks um, until the next class. Um, and I'll see you then, if not sooner. So not next week. Not next week. So um, the 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 break in classes is because next Sunday I'm doing um, Dharma Rain has a monthly sutra study class, and I am leading that at Dharma Rain on the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is a big sutra. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. So prepping prepping that and this sort of um, yeah, yeah. ran into each other. So I'll see you in two That's okay. That's all good. I'm just reminding myself. I'm just saying it. So I know. I'm going to remind myself. Yep. Oh. Okay. Yep. We're ready. Thank you. Good night, good night. Good night, you guys. Good night, everyone. Good night. Lexi, I thought, oh, Lexi's gone. <laughs> see ya. Good to see you, Laura. Good to see you.